is returning. That sounds great. For what we're using it for. Um, but from a server side point of view, you've got thousands of connections. Now, if each one of those connections has a thread associated with it, then certainly in .NET, where each thread has a default stack size of one page, you're looking at this problem. 1,000 connections, that's a OK. 10,000. OK, that's what you can see. But wouldn't it be nicer if those threads weren't three threads if we just had requests? And when something happened, we could just leap back in and say, hey, everyone who was interested in that, you now get a chance to return. Great stuff. So it really depends on where you are. Um, and the magic isn't going to stop the user from interacting. And if they set some value on a text box, then when you get to the next bit of code, if you ask the text box for its value, you'll see that new information. Sometimes that's exactly what you want. Other times, it won't. Um, in particular, suppose you want your user to be able to cancel this long running task. If they get cancelled in here, then possibly this operation supports cancellation, and you can cancel that, it won't take any resources. But either way, you can notice as soon as you do get back in and say, I'll, I'll stop doing this operation because I don't need to do it anymore. So sometimes it can be a blessing, sometimes it can be a blessing. Uh, defining long run. It's entirely up to the user. Uh, the developer rather. Um, for Windows 8, long running is defined as 50 milliseconds. In that, if you're going to do anything that might take more than 50 milliseconds, you're strongly encouraged to make it asynchronous. Um, 50 milliseconds isn't very long. <laughs> uh, so, you really do need to be thinking of doing very little in the Um Yes, in total segment. Uh, oh, the, the, the whole thing, well, the whole thing can take a very long time. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll show an example where it takes maybe five or ten seconds. Obviously, it could take a lot longer. Uh, yes, um, I would argue that if you're doing anything that's going to take two weeks, you'll be regularly checkpointing, etc., so you can recover. And things become a bit trickier. Um, but in particular, if you're checkpointing and trying to recover from where you were, you'll be doing some work that I'll show you later on with some sharp compilers doing. Anyway. Um, but if, if, it's a, if it's a reasonably simple kind of taking this chunk of work and processing each item, and uh, here's the output, then that would be fairly straightforward. Um, but yeah, your overall long running operation can take as long as you like, but you don't want to block the white thread in a way that the user might notice. Okay, uh, a very brief introduction to task of T. Um, for those of you with more of a computer science background, you can think of task as a future. Um, I only mention this because it's part of the language specification now, effectively. So this is the promise of a result. Uh, if you want to see further, these angle brackets are generics like Java. So a task of T is a promise to return a value of type T later on. So as an example, uh, the web client type has a numerical <coughs> download string task async, which is a good amount, but that returns a task of string. So you give it a URL, it gives you the promise of when it's finished fetching stuff, it will give you the text of web page. That's if you actually OK? Um, you can ask the task of T to log until we get the result of the result property. You can ask it to have a continuation, so you can say, continue with this block of code when I finish, or when you finish rather, you can check for its status, etc. And also, it supports the awaited as well. I'm not going to do too much trying to describe the feature without showing it to you, because um, describing code just doesn't work in the scene. But I will refer to this diagram a few times. So, I don't know whether the webcam's going to pick any of this up. Think of, if I'm over here, I'll probably be talking about the caller of an asynchronous method. 
Then there's the asynchronous method itself, which will be decorated with the async modifier. Then there's the async operation, which can be fetching something from a web service, loading something from a disk, loading something from a database, doing something locally in a different thread, any of those things. The boundaries between those three blocks, so effectively what makes either the return value or makes the return value work, between the call life and the asynchronous method, you either have void, uh, which basically means when you call me, I will start doing something and you won't have the faintest idea when I'm finished. Um, it's really only there to, to help with um, event patterns. Or there's task, which you can think of as task of void, which is I don't have an actual result as such other than whether I've completed and whether there was an exception. So the, the synchronous equivalent of task would be to return void. Um, or there's task of t, either generic or some kind of t. So an async method can declare that it returns task of t. And between, within the async method, when you're going to do something asynchronous, the way that the compiler works out that you've got something asynchronous that you can um, await asynchronously is that it implements the awaitable pattern, and I'll definitely show you that in the code. Right, then we code time. So forgive me for the code. Now I have lots of code here, um, and it's one plus six already. I know that really you won't get so I will try to be rude. Um, but I will basically ask you what you want to see as a normal form. We'll start with a simple application. I'll show you the app running, and then we'll uh, I'll explain what to do. So it's fairly small, but I've got a username and password. Um, and I, if I put in the wrong password and it kept stocks, it will fairly quickly come back to me and say, that's wrong. If I put in the right password, it will, it's currently authenticating, and we can see what it's doing with debug bit. It's authenticating, it's fetching my stock holdings, all of this is completely mythical, of course. Then for each of these stock holdings, where I'm holding the stock ticker and quantity, it's then fetching the price of each stock ticker, doing a bit of multiplication, or not when it can't find the price of a particular stock ticker, adding it to the portfolio, and then giving me a total of it. Okay. Reasonably simple, but um, aside from anything else, we've got three different services. Authentication, holdings, and prices. And if we want to think not only in terms of asynchrony, but parallelism, uh, we can't parallelize anything else with the authentication, because until we're authenticated, we don't even know what user ID we'll use for finding out holdings. We can't fetch the prices before we fetch the holdings, because we don't know which prices to fetch, but we could parallelize fetching each of the prices. Currently we're in the <coughs> and you can see um, this is very small, um, but I've got timestamps with each price fetch, and I've made it pause between one and two seconds uh, for each of these prices. Um, just to demonstrate while it's doing stuff, the user interface is still um, responsive, Oh, I've got that, uh, the um, so, yeah, it's always wanted while we're working. Very simple, let's look at code. So, if you've done any C sharp before, um, I'd like you to imagine what this code would look like if you were writing it in the Windows form. Um, there are two fairly obvious approaches that you could do. One would be to do it using asynchrony. Um, and add all continuations everywhere, and that would be tricky. The simpler way would be to use a background thread to do all the actual business logic, as it were, and then whenever you wanted to update the UI, you would have to go back into the UI thread, update the user interface, and you, can, you could do that itself, asynchronously, but you'd have to remember to do that. Let's have a look at what we actually do. So um, I'm not going to pretend this is all lovely code, but at least I have got some sort of um, separation of concern. So I've got interfaces for the different services involved. Um, 
nothing interesting in the constructor. When you click the button, it calls into this fetch stops method, which is itself decorated with async. But really, this just does a little bit of preparation. So it plays out the, uh, the stacks, um, calls into this fetch stops async, and then locks it. All the interesting stuff is in here. So I'll concentrate on this. So, two things to note from just the declaration. This method is decorated with the async modifier. Um, this isn't really needed. I mean, you got to put it in, but the C sharp team didn't have to put this into the language at all. They could have said, like they did for iterator blocks, um, which is sort of the generator pattern, if you've got any await expressions within the method, then I'll assume it's meant to be async. Um, however, that has odd effects in that if you commented out the last await, then the execution flow would completely change, um, which isn't nice. Um, and also, it kind of tells the reader, you should expect that this is going to be asynchronous. It returns a task, as in, we haven't got anything useful that we want to return from this method. You know, it, it does everything that it's meant to do without producing an overall result. But someone might want to see when it's finished and might want to see it as it. Okay. So I'm not going to explain to start with what the await keyword does, but just follow the code without thinking too strong about it. So we, we start off with a try block, and unfortunately, the finding block is all the way down here. So all we're doing in this try finally is saying we're going to initially stop the user from fetching again while we're still working. So we can see that working. If I hit fetch stops, it's grayed out button. And however we complete, even if I get the wrong password, so when that has completed, I didn't have translation for this example. Um, even if we get a failure, when we clear the message box, the button pops on again. So this is try finally working as we'd expect. However, we need the method, it's going to enable the button. The actual code, um, log is just a, a utility method. It's nothing very um, tricky. All it does is direct people to append text from the text box. So we better be using the UI thread if we're going to do this. Otherwise, we'll get an exception to the cross thread um, equation. So you can see log kept it around the place which means we're definitely always in the UI code whenever we're executing any of this code. So we do a log, <coughs> we call into our authentication service, and that returns a task of null with. So the idea is if we've managed to authenticate, it will return the user ID. If authentication fails, it will return that. It's not the only way that we can represent the, the failure, but let's go with it for a moment. So we fetch the user ID, Check whether or not it's null. If it is, all we need to do is show the message box and then return. Note that we're just doing return. Even though the method itself returns to pass, we're just returning as if we were returning from a void method. We then fetch the stock holdings. So again, we call into our dependency, our portfolio service, and we call get portfolio async, passing in the user ID. This time I haven't bothered showing it, but that returns a task of list of stock holdings. So it says, you will call me this method, and I, I promise that at some point I'll give you all the different stock holdings for the And again, you are easy. Finally, we're going to actually call into another async method. One of the nice things about async is its composability. And this time, we've actually got something that returns the task of decimal. It's going to return the total. So given all the holdings, fetch prices, which our initial stab of this is just going to be synchronous, or sorry, it's not going to be parallel. It's asynchronous, it's an asynchronous method. Um, we're just going to loop over each holding, look it up, add a portfolio entry to the, the grid view thing, um, if we've actually got a price for it, then we'll add it to our total worth. 
And then at the end, you'll return total work. Now again, note that the, the type of total work is decimal. Um, if you're a Java program, I think the decimal is not quite the same, but similar. Um, and we're just returning that. And again, the fact that the method itself returns pass off decimal is all just broken. So we've already seen that when we return, the compiler is going to wrap our result in a task of t. And the other side of this is the await keyword that I asked you to forget about for a moment. <coughs> so before I explain what it's, what it's doing, would you all agree that that looks pretty much like you would write the synchronous code if you didn't care about blocking the UI? Yeah? You can follow this code. It's not spaghetti code. Um, and believe me, it would look a lot simpler if it went to the 19 point font that takes up the whole screen. This looks like two very small numbers. So what does a wait do? Well, it takes, in these particular cases, a task of t, waits for the task to complete, and then unlets it. That's all. The only thing is that while it's waiting, it isn't working. So effectively, from the caller's point of view, the original caller, this block on the left, when it hits an await expression, the method might return. It might not, because the task may have already completed. If we were hitting a cache or something, there's no point in doing context switching and attaching a continuation of all kinds of turning stuff if we're immediately going to get pulled back into the continuation and keep going. So it's not like await always shoves everything off to continuation. But it often does, and in this case, it, it, I can pretty much guarantee that it does because I explicitly put delays. So when we hit this await, the method will return, and you might think, well, how can it return? I suppose the task is not so bad, but the task is decimal. How can it return when it hasn't got the result? Well, it doesn't need to have the result, it just has to have the promise of a result later on. So we're at the situation where we called into our asynchronous operation, and that has quickly returned us the promise of our user ID or our holdings or a or a simple price. <laughs> the asynchronous method is saying, okay, I I can't do anything else until I put the value out of that class. So it says to the asynchronous operation, please call me back when you finish. And then says to the caller, okay, I'm done now. Here's a promise of here's something you can watch to see when I finish. And it's out of there. All that collapses to whatever it needs to. Then later on, this asynchronous operation finishes. And it says, ah, oh, hang on, I've been told when I finish, I've got to call this chap over here. So we call back into our asynchronous method. The cunning bit, the bit that the compiler spends quite a lot of effort doing, is making sure that if we get to, for example, this await here, the continuation points to the end of that expression. So it immediately keeps going, and we're in the middle of a loop here. Well, it just keeps going in the middle of a loop. And likewise, earlier on, even though we were awaiting the authentication task, you might think, hang on, but we're in a try finally box, so when we return, it's going to re-enable the button early. Well, no, because the compiler realizes that you haven't completely returned from there. You're just kind of pausing it. So it doesn't run finally box on its way out at that time. It will only do so when you logically have reached the final block. And it also makes sure that when you do an await, when, when the asynchronous method awaits an asynchronous operation, it captures the context in which it's already running. In this case, the UI thread but it could be other things. For example, if you're on a protocol thread, you probably don't care which protocol thread you come back and execute the rest of your code on. But you could do you could do whatever you want. You might have multiple protocols and make sure that you come back to the same protocol 
Maybe you've got a high priority triple and a low priority triple. Some operations you want to be really high priority, others you don't care when they run. So it will come back to the context that you call this on and make sure, in our case, that all of our async method code runs on the UI code. Doesn't matter if this guy over here might have used other threads, or if not, it's just an asynchronous operation. One way of getting a task is to say task.run some method or some block, and that runs in a different thread. And you can await the result of that without blocking the UI thread. This just goes off in the background, and then the continuation gets posted, and the way it happens to get posted. You get to run all of your code in the UI thread in one synchronous looking bit of code. Posted for Windows Forms and is the same as if we called control block. Yes. Should I think of execution rules? Yes, absolutely. This is this is like a pause button. And then one only code well we said that we can't. We haven't got anything more that we want to do on this thread that's 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 until it. that's finished. So something else can use this thread and the user can move to other around. So it's paused, not in terms of the thread, but in terms of the method. And that's the tricky bit to get ahead of. Speaking of tricky bit to get ahead of, what would we like to see next? Okay, the choices are I can show you how all this works under the covers. Um, I should probably actually next describe the awaitable pattern, but just to um, attempt your taste buds, we also have how on earth would you do test things like this? Um, a bit of an example of composition. I can make this go in parallel. Um, I think those are the simplest uh, examples. Um, the, the idea of composition, I can show you a magic trick, which just I love. I, I will definitely get that in. It's just the most fabulous thing. Yes? Um, no, I'm not understanding. Can you see the bit the lately in the next one where you go find all the prices? Yeah. Um, and it was, it was in the weight somewhere. There was, uh, There's an the weight here. So yeah. you have to look at the price and so wait the results. If you're waiting there, then how do you carry on going around the loop to get the next price? And how do you therefore do them all in parallel? So this isn't in parallel. Ah, okay. Okay. This, this time isn't in parallel, but it is asynchronous. So we're not going to be blocking anything, but it's done. So you're not it's really it. important to understand that asynchrony and parallelism aren't the same thing. So you're not blocking any other threads, you're just blocking this thread. Uh, no, you're not blocking this thread. No, you're not blocking this thread. This is just clean. Logical operation. Yeah. You can't actually you're not executing any more of this thread, are you? Do the away this to the away. Yes, absolutely. We're releasing this thread. Yeah. And so the, the confusing bit is we we tend to associate okay. a stack with a logical operation. And this separates them. Right. So the first time, if we get to let's let's think about the, the very first of the impression. Okay. When we await this. We will actually have a stack trace, if we threw an exception here, we would have a stack trace that shows fetch stock taking, and that being all by fetch stocks, and that being all by a button click handler. Okay. If we then looked at the stack immediately after the await, we wouldn't have that stack trace anymore. We would just have the message loop that said, call into the continuation. Okay? <laughs> That particular stack frame wrapped up in the, in the, in the how you resemble how you in the configuration. This is why it's difficult to do by hand. So the compiler is making it look as if all this, you know, we're used to thinking of, hey, this is on the stack, right? Well, not so much really. Okay, so it's still mm -hmm. magic to make it look like a familiar execution environment whilst separating out the idea of a stack from the logical flow of method. Is this is it really is it really good for me using some code regimes or not? Uh, I have implemented code regimes in this. Um, and it's fun. I've implemented come from 
in this, um, which is a power of use of it. Um, it requires doing something that the language specification explicitly says you should not do, which is executing the same continuation twice and poking it. So, so let me mention the secret earlier. This is all built in state And um, if you pass around nastily enough, you can say, hey, state machine, you, I want you to be in state two now. And go back to an earlier continuation. Um, don't tell do that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's doing all of that stuff for you so that you don't have to because it's really error Yeah. Uh, so just to just confirm, so when the await happens, the stack gets in the language and it gets it goes back to what was invoked this object, which was a button handle, and that button handle goes up inside with API. Yeah. And then that thread gets at that point, and then obviously probably goes through the uh, wind proc and skews other yes. handlers. So the, the, button possibly handle this goes. the button handle calls out off that event, um, and that calls down into this async method. And then as soon as that says, whoa, I can't do anything for a while, I don't want to block the thread. Everything on one as far as it needs to. If the button handle needs to do, maybe we've got the second handler. You know, that starts executing, and it goes back to the message loop. The message loop goes idle, um, or maybe you wiggle mouse around or whatever. Then, when the continuation is called, it's called <coughs> directly by the message loop. So we, we don't have. It doesn't rebuild all of the all of the stack for you. It just makes sure that your context in this method, all the local variables that you've got. The fact that you're in a loop, etc., it propagates all of that. I just thought it, it was something of what trouble understanding. As you say, when, when you hit a wait, just the thread is released. What's the thread doing? If the thread has gone back to the wind prop and it's yes. on the forward, that, that's where the thread is. Exactly. So, so the thread is being the normal idle UI thread, or in the case of the thread pool, it's sitting in the thread pool, or in the case of code routines, it can be um, executing the next piece of code routine. Um, yeah, it doesn't have to be available. Um, why don't I show you what the awaiter does now? Um, the awaiter will have You can. Um, so let's, let's do that. Um, I should be able to do that. Um, I right. I'm not much of a compiler fan, so. Um, there are all kinds of tricks that I don't know anything about, I'm sure. So one thing we can see, this is probably too small to see, but we've got the top stack frame is fetch.sync, async, called by fetch stops, called by control dot config, called by button config. And I will now step over step there. Um, step and we haven't awaited anything yet, so we're still just executing synchronously, but we've got the task. And ironically, if I just sit here and talk for long enough, that task may now have completed. Because all it's doing is authenticating. In fact, I don't know whether it will, because this is just using task of delay, which is a sort of asynchronous version of Red or C. Um, let's, if we have a little look at all the tasks, oh, and it's still there. Oh, it's, it's waiting for activation, so I think it's still going to wait. So watch the set, for, no, set frames. Yep, here we go. Um, we're in a move next runner. So actually, we've got a huge amount of um, stuff that's dedicated to the machinery of async, which you can mostly just ignore. Um, but importantly, when we get right down here, we don't have anything that's doing um, our own thing. We've certainly exited all of that. Um, and we can just keep going. So you can absolutely debug, and the any exceptions thrown, um, there's stuff in .NET 4.5 to manage to give you something looking like a normal tag phrase, even if it's been thrown by a sort of thread. There's extra help for marshalling that kind of thing. Any more questions before I show you what the pattern required for a way to do what if it's this statement variable for the word we could await? Sorry, which one? The, the simple, one? Uh, the first statement we're away from. Yeah, the uh -huh. one ready. Yeah. yeah, if you copy the case to the in the next line. Yeah. 
So are we in the same path? Yeah. <coughs> then because uh, this has finished already, the second time the await expression will say, have you already finished? Oh, you have. OK, just give me the result, please. No, it's the same user ID and you do it. I'm not sure I follow. Yeah. So uh, you can, you can exactly certainly do it. Uh, well, it, it would have to not include the declaration because you can kind of say, okay, the same place, but no, okay. uh, basically this would assign the same value to the variable again, um, and because once, once the task is completed, it doesn't uncomplete. I, I like to think of a task as being like a cardboard box that says, I'm going to have a cat in at some time in the future, and I'll tell you when. Well, when we've already opened that box to have a look at the cat, if someone else says, could I have a look at the cat? It's not like you close up the box again and say, right, you've got to wait a while. You, know, you can already see the cat. Um, so it doesn't need to do anything at that point. It can just say, yeah, sure, here's the result. Indeed. But if you wrote in instead of the second quarter task, the whole uh, in in education in service up, up there, then it would wait again. Wouldn't it? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes, there is no magical caching going on. It's just that the task itself knows it through the way. And what is the purpose of uh, is the garbage collector actually good? Uh, the garbage collector, there's some interesting stuff about the garbage collector here, in that until you hit the first await, all these variables, all the local variables, genuinely are on the stack. Because the state machine that's generating is a struct. Um, apologies to those who don't know C sharp. This is going into C sharp and botnet specific stuff. Um, so the state machine sort of wants to be a class on the heap because we're going to be calling into it for different things, um, and in particular because if your stack disappears from under you and you want to still have these values around, it's got to go. Um, the way it works is it's a struct. It's on the stack until it needs to be uh, until you need to release. At which point it gets boxed onto the heap. Um, cunning stuff happens to make sure that it's got a reference to itself so that there's only ever one box value on the heap. Um, that's got all these local variables, local variables in it. Um, and that can only be garbage collected when the whole async method has been heated. Um, it makes sure that none of this is garbage collected before it should be certain. Okay, let me show you the, the await thing. So this is um, a, an example. No, not so much, not so much. Um, this is not what things actually look like because a lot of this is pattern based. But you can sort of think of it as if task of T implemented by a weight of T. So if, if you're familiar with my innumerable or Java iterable, where you say, get me a cursor to iterate over this thing. We've got something similar. It's not clear to me whether this is actually required or whether you could just have an awaited thing, but this is effectively what we've got. So something that's awaitable has to have a get away method, which we then put in a little call get awaiter to get an awaiter. And then while uh, waiting, I will just call get result immediately. Otherwise, I will make sure I've got a continuation. All on completed and then return. And the on completed passes in a continuation where the first thing it does after getting the state machine to write on the code is call get result. So you've got sort of the shortcut and the long path where it needs to actually await. And the idea is, however you got there, by the time you hit get result, you should be back where you started. The two paths should be equivalent. Okay? Now I said this is a pattern. There is no such interface as I wait for or I wait for. There is an I notify completion that has this void on completed, and there's also a um, ID critical notification, completion notification or something, which has an a void on say completed. Yeah, your pretend classes uh, interface, it's, it's very similar to uh, the rest of extensions. Uh, yes, I'm not at all surprised. Um, the problem was this is quite similar to reactive extensions, um, which is sort of like a push version of binumerable, where instead of saying gimme, 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 you say 
tell me when you've got a, a result, tell me when you've finished getting a result, or tell me if there's a problem. Um, so it's sort of an inside out version of asynchronous. Uh, uh, sorry, of I knew. And it can often be used for asynchrony, and it has, I haven't looked at how um, the React extension teams have integrated with async, but they have. So there are ways that you can, I think, adapt from one form to the other in the way that you use um, previously. Uh, so, um, the compiler makes sure that whatever you try to await has a get awaiter method or an extension method called get awaiter, which returns something which implements this pattern. Um, an extension method for those multi sharp folks is a method in a static class going miles away from the actual type, um, which is decorated to say, I'm an extension method, pretend I'm an instance method on this type over here. So a string doesn't have a reverse method, but you can define an extension method called reverse and then call you know, in, in quotes foo dot reverse and the compiler just says, right, I'll switch that round to be reverse and then pass foo as the other one. So it's fine to do that as getawaiter as well, um, to create a getawaiter um, extension method on some other type. And that's in fact how the uh, original technology previews of all of this stuff worked. They gave you some libraries, and the libraries contained extension methods on task of T, and task of T itself didn't have a getaway. It does now, um, and they're able to make it more efficient. Okay, so uh, we have, is it until from past seven that I've Or until kind of seven? We're not going to do our half Just do that. Right, okay. So I've got about a quarter of an hour. Um, uh, let's show you something fun. We wanted to parallelize this. <coughs> so let's run this demo. Um, if I type in the real username and password and put it on the debug, you'll see it's authenticating. Sorry, it's straight of all steps in the whole thing. Then about at one, one and a half, two second intervals, it's expecting to price. I have another version of code that has this in parallel. So if I do fetch prices parallel async, this looks fairly similar. So this takes the holdings and then transforms the um, list of holdings. I'm not going to get this on the line. Um, transform each holding into an anonymous type where the result is the holding and the result, and this is an asynchronous demo. <laughs> um, so just like you can apply async to um, actual methods, you can apply async to anonymous methods. Um, effectively, this is building a list of tasks, and each of those tasks, when you await it, will give you the whole and the price. But it will do so asynchronously by calling into the price service and only returning the result of when it's got the price back. And we call to this so that it's all not lazy. Um, so by the time we've got here, we have actually started all the tasks to fetch all prices. And now all we need to do is iterate over the tasks and await them one time. And if you look now, we will see um, in the debug, so it's still taking a while to fetch all the holdings, and then we get all the prices really quickly together. Looks better? Yes? Can anyone think of any slight problems with this? Yeah. If the first task took 20 seconds and all the rest on right. two seconds, then it's already 20 seconds. Spot on it, as if I planned to <laughs> Let's do exactly that. That really was exactly the, uh, the answer I wanted. So our simple stock price service Right, so we'll say if these are the implementations of all of these things, all, all I do is await task dot delay. Um, so if ticker equals acne, which I'm pretty sure is the first one that I've got, um, that'd be uh, a big context. So John has acne. Um, yeah, my, my real password isn't C sharp 5 anywhere, so don't think you want that. Oh wait, password delay, 5,000. Okay, so this will be five seconds. So now when we run this, we will expect to see 
um, absolutely nothing for quite a long time. And after about five seconds, plus the fetch and the holdings and fetching the price, you'll get all the stocks all at once in a starting Okay? It's still okay. You're still getting the total as quickly as you can possibly get the total, but it's not ideal. We'd really like to see the results as they came back. Yeah? Well, um, what's the difference between case and training and multiple trading now? Uh, well, for one thing, it's only one trade. Um, so the benefits of that are it's not taking any more resources. Probably not a problem for a client that where you, know, you can afford the extra one mega stack that's not going to kill you on a server if you have one extra thread per request. If there are long running requests, that's going to be a pain. Um, it also means that all of this code, you didn't see a single control box to begin invoke or anything else to get back to the UI thread, either to ask for data from UI elements or to add the um, portfolio thing. So it makes all of that easier because all of the code that I've written just run one one thread. Just um, a lot of this is making stuff that you could do before infinitely simple. Okay, everyone happy with where we are at the moment? I should write some magic. <laughs> so, if I do tasks of incompletion order and run it again, it does it exactly as the method describes. I'm going to iterate over those tasks in the order in which they can be. So we've got four of the results, and soon Acme will show up with the last one. Doesn't that sound like magic? I'm calling incompletion order, and obviously they haven't yet completed. Let me show you how the magic works. So we've got a method called magic with uh, a possible magic ordering. So we've got task extensions, and I have created an extension method for any sequence of tasks you, that you uh, want to give me. I will give you them back in the order in which they will complete in the future. Not right. What I'll do instead is I'll give you the same number of tasks with the same results in the order in which they complete. So if you give me five boxes that will eventually have cats in, I'll give you back five boxes that will eventually have cats in. They're not the same boxes. What I know behind the scenes is I'm, I will create five empty boxes with holes in the back, which is the, the longer version of task completion source. Now imagine this in terms of cats, okay? You give me five boxes, I create five of my special boxes with a hole in the back. I then start watching each of the five boxes you gave me. And I also return these five boxes, and I know the order in which I return my boxes to you. I'll watch all of these. As soon as one of them, maybe it's the last one, comes back with a cat in, I will put that cat into the first box that I gave you back. When the second one comes, I'll put it into the second box. And so it continues. I don't know, it just did right. Um, <laughs> so this was, um, I wrote a blog post a while ago uh, demonstrating a different form of composition where I say, you give me um, any number of tasks that will return a value, and I'll let you know the majority verdict. So if you've got five different stock price services, then so long as three or more of them come back with the same result, as soon as three of them come back, I'll give you that result. Yeah, if they come back with very different results, I can't give you a majority result, I'll throw an exception, etc. In fact, if I get um, three different results, then they can't, sorry, four different results, then they can't possibly be a majority verdict, and I can throw an exception before the final one has even come back, etc. And I implemented it in a very inefficient way. And someone said, well, why don't you just do this? And then you can just watch them as they come back. So that, that's the magic. Note that this isn't an ATM method. It just happens to return a sequence of tasks. I will very briefly um, talk about how you can unit test this. Oh, yeah. I do that. Uh, you... Right? Let's do what you have. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. It's right. just an asynchronous Right. Yep. Yeah. And let's assume that I'm going to pay for these two 
more of that. Right. Yep. So I don't care about the rest. Yes. Can you do that? Yes. So um, what I could do is uh, what do you want me to do if the so you want to get oh, some yeah. of these three clouds that come back within Right. I'm not going to prove it now, but uh, what you could do is have two tasks, one of which would process things as they as they came back, and one of which would be a delay for three seconds. And then we both have a cancellation token that we pass in. This is normal stuff from .NET Core to say you know, I can cancel you whenever I like. It's up to you to watch and do the appropriate thing. And I can say which is going to complete first, the delay or the processing all the things. And whichever completes first, I'll cancel the token and either the, the, the delay can stop if you come back quickly or you can stop processing. And what I want to do is do at least three of them, not necessarily all five. <coughs> right, at least three by the maximum time. I don't wait more than X amount of time. Right. Um, so yeah. what happens if we've only processed two and you've got three seconds? Yeah. Right, it's um, so, at least three. Um, so, at one, least three, but not greater than. Right. All of this is doable, yeah. but I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't write one routine to do all of those. Instead, yeah. I would write various building blocks, yeah. and the great thing about all this being composable in the same sort of example that we've given is you can write each bit. And so, if you wanted something that says, give me the first n results out of them, that's really easy to do, and, and, and cancel the rest. And I can do another thing that says, and take at most this amount of time. Um, and I can probably do something else that says, give me, um, I, I think we would have to work out the policy side yeah. carefully, yeah. and then work out how to decompose it. Because and then we sort of box it the way forever. Yeah. And one thing, I, one thing I haven't explained is how exceptions work in all of this. Um, and basically, you can either make sure that it all looks normal. There's a slight hiccup in that um, multiple things can go wrong in some cases. Certainly when you do a task block when all, which says, I've got loads of tasks, let me know when they all finish. Um, if all of them go bang, then you've got five exceptions or how many exceptions. Um, and the way that the normal try catch works uh, with async is it says if there's at least one exception in, in the task, so task, task dot exception returns an aggregate exception that can, can contain more than one. The compiler says, I'll just throw away all the, the waiter says, I'll throw away all the first. And you can catch the first in a strongly typed way. And that's almost always what you want. Um, but you need to be aware of when there might be multiple exceptions, and then you can always ask each of the original individual tasks what their exceptions were. Or I've got another extension method on task, um, I don't think I've got a thing here, in fact, um, that says, actually, don't wrap up, don't unwrap the exceptions, give me back the original aggregate exception. So you could do um, try um, to task dot with multiple exceptions as an extension method, that returns something that implements the awaitable pattern, and then catch aggregate exception, oh, I'll look at all the exceptions. So it's really easy to add that when you want to, and most of the time, frankly, you're not going to manage um, to, to think about multiple things going on at the same time, or you don't care. Uh, right, we're pretty much out of time. I'm not going to um, even start with the time machine. Um, so in order to unit test this, really you want to be able to, <coughs> to say, well, what happens if two of them complete and you know, if we've got three tasks and they complete in order two, one, three? Well, I want the return tasks to um, complete in the right order and the first one already have completed when task two has completed because it's the first one, etc. I will show you that, there, that it is possible to use it. So, as an example, I created my machine. I scheduled success cases. So, these tasks will actually be in order of one, two, three. But then I'm going to create an array of them out of order, two, three, one. 
and then I can say execute in context, which is pretend I'm in a single threaded context because I really, really don't want threads involved in my tests. That's the root of um, I've got an enhancer, which is like a solid screwdriver of time, so I can say um, I'm going to get call my production method in completion order. I'm going to advance time to t equal three, and then all of them should have results. And that's one task, one, one test, and the results should be in the order that we decided they were completing, not the order we combined them. And then there's a slightly longer test that says, before we start, at t equals zero, all of the tasks concerning the by method should be waiting for activation. Then when we've advanced the t equals one, the first one that we gave back should have said, hey, I finished, and the other, the other two are still waiting. And when we advance them again, the final one uh, I'm not going to go into the actual code involved in that, but just take away the idea that, hey, you can, after we've advanced them again, the next one we will be using things that are testable, of course. So here we're passing in the task directly. And we were trying, we were unit testing um, some production code that would use our authentication service and our portfolio service. We could say, uh, use normal blocking frameworks to say, when you're called to ask for, the, uh, ask to authenticate user John password 2, then um, return this task that, is, that comes back from the time machine and will finish in a certain way at a certain time. Okay, right, that's the setup done. Now, call my method, okay, advanced time, oh yes, the result was it failed authentication and we didn't call into the call. So, it's testable, it looks like magic, feels like magic to work with it, but as you can see, there's, yeah, there's good stuff underlying it. Um, I didn't show you the horribleness that is the uh, the decompiled sample code. So, as an example of this little async method, where it's got a loop, it's got a couple of awaits, but so less than a screen full of code. The code that's generated for that is all of this. Lots of go tos, lots of all kinds of stuff. <coughs> um, I have subtitled other talks uh, around async, go to considered awesome. <laughs> so long as you're not writing or reading the go to, it's fine. The compiler does a great job. Um, so, all of this is just about predictable if you want to go into it all. It's not magic, it just feels like it when you want. And that's basically it. So, I hope if you're using C Sharp that this will encourage you to dig in deeper. There's so much more to know about it, um, but it's really, really great. Thank you. Uh, the spaghetti is all in what the code would have looked like if we weren't using async. Um, so if we tried to do this with continuations manually, it would have been horrible. We either have had each bit, well, I can't even think about how we would have done the loop bit of looping over all the prices, because when each one finished, we need to remember that we still had some to go. So we probably need to extract an extra class to hold that state information, and yeah, it gets yucky. I would almost certainly have forgotten that when we've, you know, when we've authenticated, if we got the username and password wrong, we still need to re-enable the f stops button. That kind of thing. You know, we've got two exit points from our asynchronous method. So I find it makes it really easy to re-enable stuff. With continuations, hideous mess. Um, another way, really, you have to do a right Yes, yeah. Um, obviously, you wouldn't write anything quite like this. But it would be pretty hideous nonetheless. Who is that? Uh, so, um, you had to write. Uh, you just wait for the mic. Yeah, sure. Okay. Try to record this. Okay. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, you had to write your uh, incompletion report. Yes. Um, that, that should be part of the standard library. Uh, it's a 
Yeah, so the question is, um, should things, should combinators like incompletion order be part of, effectively part of .NET? Um, I think it would be interesting to have them as part of .NET. I suspect the problem is that no one, not even Microsoft, has enough experience of how people are going to actually productively use this yet to know what building blocks provide. And if you provide the wrong building blocks early on, that's there. Um, however, the, uh, there's something called TAP, which is a task asynchronous pattern. So a white paper from Microsoft that you definitely, definitely want to read, um, written by far better people, which contains all kinds of combinators at the end of it, including um, incompletion order. They call it interleaving. I think mean, incompletion order is more, uh, it says what it does. Um, but there's all kinds of things here. There's return when first has finished, all, all kinds of bits and pieces. So I'm sure that um, people will be rolling their own probably wrong deep for a while. <coughs> and hopefully in a future version, either a future version of .NET, or I suspect actually Microsoft will eventually publish an extra package on Nougat that is, here's a little of goodness. And there, there is also one package called Dataflow, which is um, another a, a set of things that plays nicely with the task asynchronous pattern um, and is particularly geared towards producer consumer type environments. I mean, in your, in your simple example, you read that straight away, so it's, it's pretty obvious it's, it's needed really, isn't it? Yeah. I, well, it's needed. There, there are other ways of doing things. We could have just attached continuation directly. But yeah. it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a straightforward way of getting an optimal result of seeing the group. So. Yes. Um, what I didn't say is. Hey, if the first one to return throws an exception, we won't notice what the other ones are doing. So maybe you want to pass in an exception handler that is attached to everything that that hasn't already passed, or something like that. Um, it's that sort of detail that comes with experience. Um, my guess is that Microsoft will be watching quite closely. <laughs> what I really hope this is why you, in Windows 8, you haven't got much choice other than to use this because. Everything's asynchronous, so you either do it by hand or you don't do it at all. Whereas in the previous world, people have just said, asynchronous do hard, I won't bother trying. I'll either do things in the UI thread or I'll shut it all over to a different thread and pull back when I need to. Um, oh, sorry. Um, is there anything within the extension for the out of language to deal with the thread and see it's like that? Inference in some way. Uh, so it hasn't been added to the platform in that it's been there since the like two mm -hmm. um, synchronization context. And it, it depends on the awaiter. It's up to the awaiter to work out, hey, I will pick up the synchronization context. Um, and in fact, you can call uh, an extension method on task. Um, I can do await task dot configure await. And say um, continue on caption context false, in which case it will say that I, I assume you don't care about continuing on the same thread. Um, so all of this was previously available. There is the idea of any thread is in a synchronization context or it's not, which is sort of the critical one. Um, so all of that is is already sort of done on that yeah. Fair Another question. Um, you have the example where you want to get a majority price. Yep. I mean, just put the work on the page, for example. Um, I was thinking about a, a simpler one, but I'm wondering is it, is it, uh, is it actually implemented for any of the simpler? I mean, suppose you want to start a boat, right? You're having a number of tasks and you're going to come true or false. Yep. And you just want to get the majority, which clearly once you've got what side of true or false is more than half. That's exactly the same. Yeah, but do you still have to, do you still have to Construct the new list of the new array of list of tasks, or can you is always do it without even doing that? Um, well, you got all the tasks to you, the original ones, but you had to construct new ones that you returned, didn't you? Uh, oh, the incompletion order yeah. happens to because that's returning a, a, a set of tasks. Yeah, without, without that, if you're doing the, the, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't show the majority voting one, and that wouldn't return a sequence of tasks, it would just return the task with two. Um, so it's got to return one task. In theory, no, it does have to create one new task to be a placeholder for when I've got the majority that will contain that program. Not all the not all the right. okay. Any more questions? 
you can chat to me later on as well. Or Absolutely. Or email me. Absolutely. I have a look at you. Some people will put in on their slides now. If you just search me on there, you can And can we get to the URL to do that? Uh, I can do so. Um, let's just see. I, I don't need to do that. But yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's the task is it should be easier to find. We've known for a couple of decades that writing is very appropriate. And this is So I want to thank John for running this video for and really appreciate it. Please join me. Right, okay, now, John, uh, do take a break. I'm just going to grab my, I've got some slides on this machine, so can I borrow it? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Just do exit. Yeah.